Last time on For Wild's Sake. I am the grandson of Igor Sikorsky. I am connecting or channeling my grandfather when I am flying up here. The greatest threat right now is introduction of invasives. It's a tough one. I mean, I'd love to sit here and say that we're the answer, but you know, we're probably more of the problem than the solution. They're really hard to catch. You can't just go there and catch fish because people come for miles around for three days and they don't catch one. Please listen carefully. Surrounded by nearly 5,000 acres of old-growth forest, Big Reed is a relic from pre-colonial times, unaltered from the days when Thoreau first laid eyes on his main woods. Unlike the other 85% of Maine's commercial timberland, this small oasis has been protected in perpetuity by the Nature Conservancy. It's one of the primary reasons bluebacks have survived there, but despite all that, it was nearly lost two decades ago. About the late 80s, someone discovered that smelt had been introduced. We do not know how they got there. Um, we suspect that it was an angler that moved them illegally with the idea that it was going to provide some forage for the trout and char. Smelt are zooplanktivores, so they are grazing off the, the zooplankton that young char really require to survive. The smelt took hold and they became the dominant species and the brook trout that are in the pond and the blueback trout that are in the pond nosedived over the course of the next six or eight years to near zero. As fish numbers plummeted, the state organized and set into motion one of its most ambitious recovery plans ever. We knew it was gonna be a huge project to try to pull off. You would think that we had a plan, you know, very early on and that we stuck to that plan, but it wasn't that case at all. We set a course and that course changed so many times over the years that uh, it, was, it was a constantly evolving plan. The most extravagant solution, the most expensive solution, and the most genetically pure solution was picked. And that was to extract as many blueback as we could out of the pond, and extract as many natural native-born brook trout as we could, and then kill the pond with a chemical called rotenone, something that they use regularly as a piscicide. Well, that first year, you know, we, we caught two or three, I think, in 2007. So we realized that this is gonna take, you know, a bigger effort. So we knew it was gonna be big and complicated and very expensive. We really never had a budget. We were just kind of operating year to year. A big part of the project was getting a private hatchery on board with us, that somebody that we could work with that had an appropriate facility that could quarantine the fish 
to take care of the fish, culture the fish, and work with us. And we did have that private hatchery in Gary Picard. Every year we were thinking, well, maybe we'll reclaim next year. It was four years that we spent capturing fish in the wild. Fishing and netting and weir netting and gill netting and any way we could get blueback and we got eight. We were really close to losing that population. I think another three to five years, there would have been so few fish there that we would not have been able to catch them. In 2010, the pond was what we call reclaimed. There were plenty of people like, why are you doing this? You know, you're probably not going to succeed anyway. It's going to be a half a million dollar project, a whole bunch of volunteer work if you added that in. And on top of that, I mean, we killed a pond. We had administrators that were really threatening to shut the project down halfway through. To me, there was no question, fix the pond and get those fish back in there because it was perfect. There were stumbling blocks along the way, and a lot of it had to do with culture of the fish in the hatchery. Um, I have to say right now, if it wasn't for Gary's commitment, it never would have been successful. Gary Picard built a building, dug a well for the water to keep these blueback and brook trout completely hermetically sealed off from all of his other work, and then hatch all of those trapped fish in private captivity and release them back into the pond. So you'd end up with this pure, original genetic strain of what came from the pond back in the pond. We brought them from the brink of extirpation back to a really viable population in there. So it's a success story. Once the work was finished and the reintroduction of native bluebacks was showing promising results, restrictive regulation was placed on angling. We were limited to artificial flies only and no trolling. Nothing new to us, but far from the most efficient if your goal is to catch a blueback. The major push for this project was, you know, to restore the genetics and the cultural side of, of that resource, not, not the angling. Angling was secondary. And it, they're really hard to catch. You know, your arm can fall off if all you want to do is catch a blueback trout. They live in deep, cold areas of the lake, requiring full sinking lines and long casts. After each cast, we counted down from 60 until our lines dangled more than 40 feet directly below us. From there, we slowly retrieved our streamers up through the water column, hoping to entice a fish from the icy depths as it passed them by. It was more like deep sea jigging than the visual excitement of most fly fishing we were accustomed to. We were told that our chances of catching a fish was low to begin with, which added to the uncertainty of this blind retrieve. You can't just go there and catch fish. Those people come for miles around for three days and they don't catch one. After several hours, we started to get nervous. We had five lines in the water between the two boats, and no one had gotten so much as a strike. All we needed was one fish, and without it, our mission was a failure. The magazine wouldn't have its story, and we wouldn't have our illustration reference. We tried varying our retrieves and switching flies, but nothing seemed to work. Karen, you want your jacket? Uh, not, not if we're going up to the cabin. Thank Adorable. 
I've fished ever since I was six years old, and I've gone through all the stages of, you know, not knowing how to fish and wishing I could catch a fish, to I've figured out how to catch a fish, to I can catch a bunch of fish. Now I really am happy with a paddle on the lake and take a couple of casts of the fly rod and set the rod down and just look around, just being on the water. And somehow that feeling taps into those fish still being down there, whether you can catch them or not. Just as hope was beginning to fade, Amy connected with something deep. The fish was strong, and it took a minute or two before she was able to muscle it close enough to the surface to get a good look at it. It was exactly what we'd come for. fish was already clad in full spawning dress, and the color was more vibrant than anything we'd imagined. Arctic char are famous for their rich and saturated hues, but the yellows and oranges seemed like they'd be more at home on a tropical reef than a lake in the middle of the Maine woods. During a brief flurry, we were able to land several more incredible fish. But just as quickly as it turned on, the lake turned back off. Amy and I knew we'd had about as good a day of fishing as anyone in the last several decades, and we'd gathered more than enough reference for my illustrations. But our time spent in the Maine woods was about more than just the fish. It was the end of an era for us, our last hurrah on the east coast before hitting the road and starting a new life out west. As much as everybody likes to quantify how their day was, you know, I caught four, I caught six, and 18 inches, and blah, blah, blah. The experience is really what people remember.
we left Bradford Camps feeling incredibly optimistic about the future of its nearby population of Arctic char. But before long, we received some troubling news. The restrictive tackle regulations had come up for reassessment, and the state had decided to ease them. The proposal passed despite groups like the Native Fish Coalition speaking out against it, and what was once a catch-and-release, fly-fishing-only pond will now allow all forms of artificial lures, treble hooks included, with a two-fish limit on Arctic char and brook trout. I was quoted as having a concern that as soon as we were able, we would roll back protective regs on Big Reed post-reclamation. And I got several challenging emails calling me negative and hearsay, and um, we all know what happened. They rolled back the regulations. It's obvious that the goal of the new regulations was to encourage more angling, but at what cost? It's a puzzling contradiction that the same people who put so much time and effort into saving these fish would so quickly be willing to put them back under pressure. Despite very little public support of the regulation rollbacks, they were passed anyway, which begs the question, why? The state believes that the restoration effort has been a success and therefore no longer in need of more restrictive regulations, or in other words, it's ready to return to the way things used to be. But the better question is, were the old regulations right to begin with? Is the message Maine's trying to send that their rarest freshwater fish is only valuable on the end of a line? Char, uh, um, I mean, I would call them endangered. We got 12 populations, two have been reclaimed in 10 years, one's in the toilet and is not gonna be able to be reclaimed, but another one's remnant. You know, I mean, how much more rare do you get? The only thing that probably keeps them off is they had a limited footprint to begin with. It's easy to get things on a list that existed everywhere and now exist nowhere. But when you had a pretty finite footprint to begin with, it's a little more complicated. The story of this small main pond and its second chance bluebacks reveals a common trend in regulatory practice throughout the Northeast, where states with some of the best native fish habitat have long catered to non-native sport fish, citing numerous reasons almost none of which are based in science. Now let's look at not losing anymore. Let's start there. Let's all agree we're not going to lose anymore. Igor asked us not to name the particular lake where we'd be fishing for bluebacks, and we understood why. Despite chartering guided trips on the lake, he recognizes that it can only sustain so much pressure. Renowned fly fishing author Ed Angle once said, I won't write about a stream by name if I can roll cast across it, and I can roll cast a hell of a long way. It's a rule we've lived by for years, though it often presents a conundrum. The state of the world's ecosystems rests largely on humanity's decision to either protect or destroy them. And in order to make those decisions, we need to collectively agree on where to assign value. But how can we value something if we don't know it exists? In the age of social media, it's a question that conservationists and recreationalists alike grapple with daily. How much exposure is too much? And when does something become in danger of being loved to death? In the case of Big Reed Pond and its recent developments and regulation change, we decided it was best to include the name so that anyone watching this will know what to search to stay up to date on what's happening. It's not something that'll happen often over the course of this series, as this isn't a where-to or how-to production, but after lots of deliberation, we decided it was best that the public be made aware of the incredibly rare and precious wildlife resource that Maine has so that they can hold them accountable were it to be mismanaged. You can stay up to date on information regarding Maine's Arctic char at nativefishcoalition.org. Well, that's kind of nice.
nice. Once back in Massachusetts, we completed our last minute modifications and said right. goodbye to our old home. We pointed Bullwinkle West and set off into the unknown. Our new life on the road had officially begun. Next time on For Wild Sake.